here is Pamela Hotz. She is a continuous improvement and innovation leader in Hennepin County's Center of Innovation and Excellence. Her adventure with Hennepin began as a temporary employee while still a student at the University of Minnesota. Okay. Upon graduation with a degree in business, psychology, and sociology, 36 plus years and dozens of positions later, Pam has been quoted to say, I have the best job in the world. With various experiences at Hennepin County Medical Center, a couple of decades in human resources and labor relations, several years in human services, an assignment in information technology with expertise in business intelligence, training in strategy management, including being certified in balanced scorecard by Kaplan Norton, a technology of participation or TOP top, master facilitator, work in strategic planning and other experiences, Pam may qualify for a master's degree with a concentration in Hennepin County. Um, in her current role, besides leading countywide continuous improvement efforts, she also created and is managing a new leadership development program, ABLE, or Action-Based Leadership Experience. And I'm going to, so without any further ado, Pamela Hotz. Her presentation up here. I think it's C. Whoa, there we go. Really big. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Welcome. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to make sure that you're all comfortable. Are you sitting where you want to sit? I know some of you move forward a little more than you would normally sit, and I appreciate that. Um, is that too loud for people? Is everyone doing okay? All right. So um, I do a little bit of walking. I do a little bit of um, storytelling as we move forward here. So the one thing I'd like to talk about is I've worked at Hennepin County for a very long time. Um, I reached a point in my career where I wanted an additional challenge, and my two boys had somehow successfully graduated high school. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, were in college, and I wanted to do something more. I felt like I had all this time on my hands, and I wanted to do something more. So I did something that I never thought I would do. I scheduled an appointment with our county administrator, and it was a 15-minute meeting, because I know his time was really tight, and I said I'd like the title of the meeting to be All About Pam. And he accepted the meeting, and we met. And I said, I want to do something more. My children are in college. Uh, my husband's pretty self-sufficient. The pets are pretty easy. I want to do something more. And so we talked a little bit about options, and he didn't have anything right there. But then a few weeks later, he walked over to my office, and he gave me a board resolution that said, um, we'd like to implement continuous improvement and innovation at the county. And he said, here, do this. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so um, our, our department took that on. Um, one of the things I asked him is I said, what do you want to be different with this incentive or this program or whatever we're going to call it? And he said, I want people to think differently. And that for me is the goal of innovation, of continuous improvement, of all of our efforts is to think differently about how we solve problems, how we're... Um, innovating, how we're preventing problems, that thinking differently, that sounds great. You know, I would love to say to everyone, okay, go forth and think differently. But we need some tools for that. We need some help. And um, the, there was a person in here during the panel discussion that was talking about Kaizen events. And that's something we do. We have Kaizen events. We talk about lean training, eliminating waste. We do a lot of things there. But that's not enough. We need to be really innovative. And so we talk about innovation in our, um, in our training, in our events. And I think we can go um, now to the first slide. There's a lot of them, but a lot of them will be much quicker than this one. I promise. So one of the things we're looking at is building a culture of excellence and innovation. And we're doing that in five different ways. We look at supporting decision making, improving and innovating, and I've added changing thinking on that because that's what we do. We want to change thinking. We want to align strategies, leading change, and share knowledge. So those are things that are, I think, typical in most organizations, but that changing thinking 
is where that innovation lies. So the first thing I'm going to have you do, you have envelopes. If you would open your envelopes, please, and take out the three sheets of paper. They're actually really small sheets of paper. And this is how we would like you to think differently. So you have two horses, and you have two riders. I think they're jockeys. Um, what we want you to do is to think differently about how do you get the riders on the horses. Here's the thing though, no cutting or tearing of paper, no folding, no bending. <laughs> you have to have it on a flat surface, so a laptop or a notebook would be great, or your lap, and figure out how you can get the riders on the horses. Oh, and another thing, I'd like the horses to be galloping. And go. <laughs> Have you done this one? <laughs> For you. <laughs> when you solve it, or if you solve it, please raise your hand. Good job. Twix or Milky Way? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Those of you in the back, if you, if you solve this, good luck. I'll try it. <laughs> I'll try to get it to you. <laughs> Anyone else solving it? Absolutely. We've got two who have solved it so far. Oh, all right. <laughs> Not bad, huh? I used to pitch for a softball team. You have it? Ye Running out of candy. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yep. <laughs> Let's see. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's behind you. <laughs> I haven't taken out an eye yet. <laughs> Back there? Okay, this is the last candy. Behind the pink shirt. Oh, way off. <laughs> I don't know the aerodynamics of candy very well. <laughs> okay, so you can keep those. You can keep working on them. Um, there actually is a solution. It just takes some time. And it really does mean that you have to look at a problem differently. So how many here are in the IT field? Like a lot of you. Okay. So I've been on both sides of IT. Not that there's sides, but there kind of is. There's the business users and there's the technical people. And they both have great value to the organization. There's probably other sides to this too, but there's two that I've worked with. And what was always frustrating for me as a user is when someone said, please tell me your business requirements. And I thought, I don't know what they are. <laughs> Tell me what the options are. And then the IT people would say, <laughs> you know, here are, you know, just tell us what you want. Well, I don't know what I want. And then how can I have business requirements if you can't tell me what you want? So a lot of times, and this is what I'm going to read here, a lot of times we create a, we have a problem and we look for a solution. And so I think that happens a lot of times in the IT world. Unless I can identify a problem in the business world, how can you solve it? And so what systematic inventive thinking gets to, okay, I'm really not following the slides, I'll get there. So we want to meet people where they are. 
There's a lot of people in different places. And so if you can find out where they are and meet them there, wherever they are, then you're going to have a chance of being innovative with them. So the next slide, please. Kelly, thank you. OK, this is the Center of Innovation and Excellence in the Gulf. Let's just keep going. I think we can go for a while. OK. We're, oh. <laughs> so we talk a little bit here about innovation, continuous improvement, problem solving. We have four areas of innovation or continuous improvement in our area. So what we're really trying to do is look at level four, create the future, redesign, or design and redesign. One more, Kelly, please. OK. So this is, this is something, um, it's a model we use within our Center of Innovation and Excellence. So we have number one is the problem solver. Number two is the problem preventer. Number three, we're looking at continuous um, improvement. And number four is the creator of a new future or the innovation. Next one, please. OK. There's more on here than you need to see. But what I want to show you is systematic inventive thinking, why you came here today, is something that we use for problem solving, but we use it most creatively in the level four in the creation of a new future. OK, so you've done the horse exercise. You had to think differently in order to solve this. I have to admit, when I solved this in a class I took, I think it was by accident. <laughs> I moved things around, and all of a sudden, I got it. Now, I, I think I caused some ill feelings, because I was the only one who solved it in the class. And then other people were looking at me funny. So people might look at you funny. That's OK. <laughs> But it just takes, you have to man maneuver things differently than you normally would. OK, so about SIT, systematic inventive thinking. And I apologize, this is a little bit of a commercial. I'll go through it pretty quickly, OK? But I want you to know about the organization. Uh, nope, keep going. Systematic inventive thinking is in 69 countries. It's based out of Israel. And so anytime we have training, we try to partner with another organization because we have to fly them over from Israel, which is very expensive. But they have some really cool ways of looking at things. Okay? So they have a lot of friends around the world. They have a lot of really um, big consumers. Okay? Um, they're in Tel Aviv. I don't think they're on the beach exactly, but they're in one of those buildings. I don't know which one. I have not been there. <laughs> There's a lot of people there. They know a lot. Okay? <laughs> um, what I really like about systematic inventive thinking is they help you with the how. So again, we were talking about innovative thinking. How do you think differently? They help with that. They have some really interesting ways of helping you with thinking differently. Okay? Okay. I'd like to, this is where it gets a little interactive hint, hint. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, there are things up here. And can you see over here? Okay, all right. So there are some things here that, I'm going to move over this way a little. What can you tell me about what's on the screen? Can you notice anything the same with all of them? Mm -hmm. They all replace something. What did they replace? The old way of doing things. So if we look at the first thing, it's an exercise bike. What did that replace? Actual bikes. Actual bikes. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's different about the exercise bike? Stationary? Is it missing anything? The outdoors. Wheels, the outdoors. Okay. What about in the top center? I think it's a child's safety seat. Replace the high chair. And so what's missing? Legs. Legs. Okay. The ATM. Right. Whew, you're on a roll. Okay. Contact lenses. Glasses. Took away the frames. Soup in a bag. Liquid water has been removed. 
Amazon.com. Yep, the brick and mortar has gone. Well, now it's coming back, but <laughs> it was gone. Yep. All right, so let's move on. Next slide. So SITs, and I call them SIT. It is SIT, but they're really systematic inventive thinking. I don't know if they like being called by SIT by or not, but it's way easier. So we're going to say SIT. Um, what problem exists in the market that needs to be solved? Instead of doing that, they're coming back and saying, how can this product evolve that hasn't been thought of? And let's move forward one more. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Actually, if you would go back, please, and then, yep. All right, so I'm going to draw this. I do this in Kaizen events a lot. I am not an artist. But just, if you would stick with me, please, that would be great. So what we tell people is, this is where you are right now. If I were to ask you, could you innovate a car? So innovate a car, what would you tell me? Driverless. Driverless? The Jetsons car? <laughs> Flying cars, okay, perfect. Because those are what are called bar ideas. Bar ideas. This is where you are in order to get to a flying car. It's going to take a lot of time and energy. So now if I were to say, what if you innovated the wheels on the tire, or the wheels on the car. What would you come up with? Mm -hmm. no, no air in the tires? Those are things that are here. If I don't ask you to think too far, you may end up if you think about the car and you're just going to innovate it a little bit, you might come up with a different color, a different design. You're not going to get very far. And this is called near thinking. If I ask you to kind of be innovative, you might go far thinking, want a flying car, which I would love. That's harder to do. What we want is to think about, this is where the innovation sweet spot is. It's right in between here. And the way I help people think about this in our Kaizen events is, if I were to ask you to go to the moon today, you would have trouble. We have had people go to the moon. We know this. But you would have trouble doing that. If I asked you to go to North Dakota, you could get in your car. I know this because my children went to school <laughs> in North Dakota. You can get there on 94 in about three hours, sometimes quicker, sometimes slower. <laughs> so. You can do that. That's within your realm of possibility. When we have Kaizen events, a lot of times what people want to do right away is say, IT will fix this. We just want to automate this process. That's not the right answer. We want to automate a good process. And so you have to go through and make it a good process first. That's the whole purpose of the Kaizen event. But people jump right away to, IT can solve this for us. No pressure. <laughs> but it's not very, it's not very um, feasible. And if you're like our organization, if you want a new system, it takes a long time to get it. You have to go through a governance board. It's money. It's effort. So um, there are other ways to be innovative and um, don't require a whole new IT system. So let's talk about this a little bit more. All right, so this is the innovation sweet spot, the near ideas that I was just talking about, small changes. The ideas are too close, and they should be brought further away. They should have a little more oomph to them. The far ideas, too resource intensive, too far, should be brought closer to that sweet spot. So the, the SIT principle is it's a closed world. And the closed world means you deal with what you have right now. So you're not going to get a whole new IT system now. When you innovate a process or you, you improve a process, you may end up with a technology need 
but you need to figure out what's the best way for your business first of all. So we're going to show a little video clip and I've watched this several times. You've probably seen this. It's from Apollo 13 and it always gets me a little teary because it's just, it's exactly what we're talking about. How many of you have seen Apollo 13? <laughs> Putting photos online helps us make an instant Here we go. Gene, we have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb, which meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over. Over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It's just this isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting... We never have toxic. technology problems. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. this one and we got to come through we got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this using nothing but that let's get it organized okay okay let's, let's build a filter better get some coffee going too so that's one of the sit principles it's a closed world they have no other options they can't run to the store and get more parts they have to deal with what they have and so when you do that you actually end up being more innovative and they've done studies and if you want um, information on this I was going to give you a resource guide and then that's on paper so just google systematic inventive thinking look it up there's all kinds of information on it so you can watch a video of somebody teaching this from SIT, who's really an expert in this area. I'm just telling you how we use it in Hennepin County. Okay, thank you. The next slide, we're gonna talk about subtraction. Um, SIT has five different tools to use. I hope to get to three of them today. These are things that you can use in your organization or your personal life, and it's really kind of fun. Um, like I said, I have the best job in the world. Sorry, <laughs> but it's great. <laughs> um, subtraction. What, what they say is take a look at whether it's a product or a process or a system, and you list out all the essential components of that product, process, system. And then you look at what are the most essential items there. And then you start thinking about taking at least one of them out. So remove an essential component from a product and find usages for the newly created virtual product. So I'm going to pull this over a little bit. So Rubbermaid took away the instructions inside boxes. They put them on the outside. And the benefits clearly shows the customer how the cabinet will look once it's assembled. The instruction sheet won't get lost, torn, or otherwise mutilated. Kind of cool, huh? All right, next one. Southwest. They took away seat assignments. Um, I flew Southwest last year for the first time, and it was a very interesting experience. Just a tip, if you ever want to sit in the, by yourself, go all the way to the back. My husband was sick on the way back from a trip. He got the whole row in the back, partly because he looked really sick and no one wanted to sit by him. <laughs> but, but, and no one wants to sit in the back. And so you can actually have, you can, you can have control over who sits with you, kind of. But it's a really different way of looking at things. Oh, you're fine, Kelly. All right, so here, a yank plug. I have never seen one of these, but isn't this a great idea? That piece in the middle, if you remove it, it's easier to pull it out. As we have aging, an aging population, 
think about how much easier that is to pull out than trying to squeeze onto a, um, a plug. Next one, please. So no Wi-Fi in restaurant. Why is this a good idea? <laughs> That's something to advertise. You know, if you really want to have a conversation with somebody, there's the place to go. <laughs> we already talked about the exercise bike, but that's something, um, who would ever have thought of that, that a bike was a mode of transportation and now it's an exercise tool. Like a bike, I had to look this up to figure out what it is. Um, has anyone had a like a bike or purchased it for a nephew or your own children? You have, okay. And what is the benefit to? A, it teaches them how to balance. Yep, because there are no wheels, and so if you're going to put it, the no pedals. Sorry, yeah, there are wheels. <laughs> that would be really hard. <laughs> There's no pedals, and so a, a little child um, can start working on that balance and scooting along on a like a bike. I did look to see how much they are. They're kind of pricey, but I think there's other, I think Ikea or other places have them that are cheaper. I'm sorry, less expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, all right, so this one I had to really research a little bit too because I didn't quite understand why this would be a benefit, a lock cup. I don't know how much you spend for coffee mugs. I don't really care if somebody takes my coffee mug. But if you have a coffee mug and your coworkers are stealing them all the time, <laughs> if you remove the hole or the plug, then you have a hole and it's useless to everyone else. So, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Or you could just put it in your office. I don't know. But this is another subtraction item. This one I got excited about when I saw it on TV because this is a recent subtraction. And who would have thought that you could take away that paper roll? But when you take away that roll, that tube, think about how much doesn't end up in our landfills or in our garbage burners or whatever. That's another piece. And I don't know about your household, but we go through a lot of that. So <laughs> um, that's a really huge subtraction. It still works, um, but I think if you had asked people before, they would never have thought that they could subtract that piece of it. So this is why it gets fun in your personal life, because it showed up on TV and I went, look at that, that's subtraction. So <laughs> I know, it's a win-win. OK, so here's the actual procedure. You list the components, you mark the essential components, you subtract the, the essential components as is. You list the closed world components, replace the subtraction component with one form from the closed world. So if you think about vacuum cleaners, we might have said before that um, the essential components of a vacuum cleaner included brushes, um, a hose, the um, handle, the bags, the receptacle that holds the bag. And now if you think with Tyson, that's not right, what are they called? Yeah, Dyson. Dyson. I think I sounded wrong when I said it, thank you. <laughs> Dyson, um, they have taken away that bag. And I have to tell you, I've never really liked vacuum cleaning, but now that I clean with a, <laughs> I don't have a Dyson, but I have one without a bag, I can see all the stuff that's coming up there, and I can understand how you should be replacing your bag more often. So <laughs> I think it's a more efficient vacuum cleaner now because we don't have the bag. But I don't know that I would have been able to say, again, as a business user with IT, I want a bagless vacuum cleaner. Describe the idea, list the idea's benefits, and choose a new component to repeat the process. So this is where it gets to be hard work because Whatever component you choose to take out, then you have to examine that and say, is this feasible or not? Is this a benefit to consumers or not? And then you have to start thinking, how could this be helpful to the customer? And then I, if they haven't even asked for it, how do I sell it to them? Okay. 
you try to replace within the closed world after trying as is, um, you can subtract partially or temporarily. So you may have something that comes out for a little while and then it goes back in. You need to play around with this a lot, but if you do it and you follow the steps, it's amazing what you can come up with. Um, the tool works great on well-developed, mature products, um, and when you can apply it on services. So in our, in Hennepin County, we have a lot of services that we provide, and so we're starting to look at these processes differently. Um, subtraction often leads to new businesses or new business model innovation. Okay. So Rubbermaid, SIT helped them launch this. The only cabinet on the market with exclusively interlocking parts using no hardware whatsoever. Now, I don't know as a consumer that I would have asked for that. But when it was presented like that, I thought, I need that. <laughs> That's really nice. There's no small pieces to lose. The assembly time is greatly reduced. Okay. Mondai. So I looked at this, and I look, again looked at this online. SIT provided a lot of these slides for me. That's why I had some of the commercial one. Um, this is amazing to me. So what they've done is they have a little daisy on the side, that they, a little flower that they have cut out. And so by cutting out that piece of the, the cardboard, that reduces the weight, the weight of it a little bit. It's less paper that's needed. And the side benefit to it is that you can see as a consumer how many reams of paper are still in there. But would, if anyone, would anyone have asked that? I want to be able to see from the side. <laughs> so their thinking is a little, it's kind of backwards from what we're, we're used to. It's not solving a problem. It's coming up with, with something new and then finding out if that can help the consumer. And that's where the innovation occurs. Okay. Okay, now we're going to talk about refrigerators. What do you see when you look at a refrigerator? This one in particular, which was very popular when I was growing up. Freezer on top, refrigerator on the bottom. Let's look at the next one. Side by side. Okay. Now we're starting to look at something called division. So we're looking at a freezer and a refrigerator and dividing them up in different ways. So on the left, now you have the freezer at the bottom, which if you think about heat rises, that makes a little bit more sense. It doesn't make so much sense if you have little kids who like to get into the ice cream. So <laughs> it depends. Um, on the other one, now you've got four different doors to open. I don't think I would have ever asked for four doors, but now that I look at this, I think, okay, I'm going to use less energy because I'm only opening up one door and the rest is staying cold. Perfect. There's five doors. Thank you. I'm going to add that to my notes. <laughs> There's five doors. There's actually one on the, on the side on the right. So you open that up and you can get to your pop without opening the whole door. So that seems much more energy efficient than the first model. All right, now we'll take it a step further. Oh, well, I guess we'll talk about this one. Dividing a product or process into its components and randomly rearranging them in time or space. So again, it's looking at all the components in a product, a process, or a system, and then moving them around. And there, there's a systematic way in which they, they tell you to do this, but it's, it's something really you can figure out. You just list them out and assign them all a number and then say, okay, I'm going to take out number three. And then I'm going to switch that with number nine. And you just keep going through that. And what's hard about it, and it is tiring to do this, to do the analysis then of each of these different possibilities, you really have to think deep and hard about it. But you come up with some very interesting things. Okay, next one, please. Okay, so here's a door within a door. So <laughs> very similar to that. And so you can come up with a lot of different ideas by doing this. Okay. Even more refrigerators. The one on the right, that's really not what I would choose. But think about how, how well thought out that is. So you've got your eggs and your juice. So you've got like all your breakfast stuff right there. 
You're not going to be looking in different places. You can organize it differently. And then the cooler drawers. That's becoming more popular in kitchens. OK. Now we're going to talk about multiplication. We go until how long? 11.45? OK. We can talk about multiplication. I'm going to talk to you about levels. So have you done any of those do-it-yourself projects where you're using a level in your home? Everybody? OK, we know what a level is. There's a little bubble in the middle. So the multiplication, the idea behind it is you take a component and you have more of them. So you multiply them, but you don't just have the same amount or the same thing. You multiply it, and then you change it slightly so that it's beneficial. So if we look at the level with the bubble in the middle, when we multiply, you can go to the next one, please, Kelly. So we're going to manipulate it a little bit. Keep going. So we look at the components. We've got a plumb vial. It includes glass, bubble, liquid, plastic. There's a body. There's the edge. There's a logo. So we're going to multiply all those little bubble pieces, the vials. And then we're going to change the properties for the multiplied product or object. So we're going to look at angle. So right now, we want things to be level. That's why it's called a level, right? And so you're looking for 0% grade. All right, let's look at the next thing. What if we put 1% and 2% grade on there? So if you think about, and th they did go out and observe some of their customers using it. So that's kind of in Lean and Kaizen, it's the Gemba. You go to where the work is. So they're looking at some of the people who were <laughs> laying floors and laying pipe. And if you take a cigarette package and, uh, and tape it to your level, you can get the right slope for a floor or for a pipe. Now, why should you have to tape a cigarette package to your level to make it work for you? <laughs> How about if we have a grade on there for 1% and 2%? So they added those to the level. They're just taking the same thing, the same bubble, but they're going to have it at a different angle. OK. It can be used to align sloping floors and pipes. Identify the feasibility. Who would want this? Go ahead. You adapt the idea and make it doable. OK? So Capro is the name of the company who, who manufactured this. And they looked at the angles, and they call it top grade. Now here's the, the big part, is within one year after launch of top grade, the revenue doubled and the profit tripled. So I want you to think about if you're in a manufacturing plant, you already have it tooled up for this product. You're going to multiply the number of levels on there. Your casing's not going to change. There might be a little bit of type difference on the, the model itself, but you're not going to have to retool your manufacturing plant very much. You're taking what you have and you're multiplying it and changing it a little bit. Okay. By calibrating the vials to varying gradients, we created a tool that performs the leveling of slopes for plumbing, drainage, et cetera, at very high accuracy and for very low cost. So when you put a cigarette package on your level, that package over time can get crunched up. It's not, you can't be guaranteed of the slope every time, but on this level, you can. The product is patented. And no tooling costs were involved in its development. So that's pretty amazing, I think. All right, next one, please. They've also done it to help you level uh, pictures. And let's see what else they've done. So sales have grown by 250% in three years. I'm in government. We don't necessarily want business to increase that much. <laughs> But if we can be more, I don't know, but if we can be more efficient, if we can do things in a better way, that's very cool. Um, they have gained a reputation as an innovation leader in the industry. All right. So SIT or systematic inventive thinking, they have a ripple model and they have consultants that come out and they can help you and do different things. But what I'm talking about today is really the thinking tools that help you come up with specific solutions alternatives and opportunities for innovation. Okay. 
So before we get to that, I think we have a little bit of time. 11.24. I'm going to sneak in one more example, I think, because we have to wait 11.45, right? Okay. So this SIT organization um, resides in Israel. They have a lot of customers all over the world. They did not tell me who this customer was or which country they were from. But this consumer was interested in having um, antenna that they could put just across the borders of their fellow, <laughs> um, or the countries nearest to them, because they wanted to hear about anything that might be affecting the, the safety of their country. And so they wanted something that they could use that, that actually one soldier could carry. So there were some requirements for it. So one soldier. that it be pretty much one piece and that it be low maintenance. Because what they're expecting is that this soldier would carry the antenna with him or her out to wherever they were going and they would install the antenna, set it up, make sure it was working and then leave it. And depending on where that was, they didn't want to call a whole lot of attention to them being there. So they didn't want to go out to maintain it. They didn't want it to be really big. So they came up with an antenna that looked like, again, not an art student. Kind of like this. So this is in the base, sticks in the ground. Got this pole here, and then this is the antenna, the receiving area. Okay, this worked really well in some parts of the world. In other parts, not so well. If you get up into a mountain and you get snow, the snow starts attaching itself here. And eventually there's so much snow on there that the pole collapses. So now they have a problem. They have broken antenna. So using some of their tools, they started thinking about, okay, how can I have, in this closed world, with what I have right now, how can I solve this problem? Okay, so what are the components right now? Who can tell me? Two sticks. And probably a battery of some kind to keep it going. Okay, that's it. Now, what do you think they talked about? They talked about the sticks, the antenna, and the battery. Does anyone have an idea about how they could reinforce a pole here using only what they have in this closed world to make it stronger? Pardon me? Make it a roof shape, kind of like this. Okay. Other ideas? Go more like this. Okay, so to rearrange it. Have the antenna kind of come around here like this? With slope? Between them? They're all options of the closed world. And they all could work. Do you want to know what they did? So what, what, the, what they decided is they wanted something that was going to solve the problem only when it was a problem. So only when it snowed would the solution show up. 
So what they did, and this is like a really long class you can take at some point, but <laughs> I'll give you the short version. Um, they added little nodules here. And they kind of stuck out like that. It didn't add to the weight. It didn't really change it a whole lot. But what did it do? When it snowed, where did the snow accumulate? It still accumulated here. But it also accumulated here and here. Yep. This became stronger the more snow there was. Cool, huh? <laughs> so they really didn't have to do much other than to add those little nodules on the side. So that again is that different thinking that um, in, the, in the closed world. Oh, okay. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanted to do today is introduce you to Hennepin County, the Center of Innovation and Excellence, and Kelly and I are both in the Center of Excellence at Hennepin County. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Systematic Inventive Thinking, SIT, and the Tools of Subtraction, Division, and Multiplication. So this is a lot in a very short period of time, but now you have some tools. And you, what I would like to ask you now is, do you think of ways that, or can you think of ways to use this either in your workplace or in your home? I have buttons so I can throw at you now. <laughs> so we, we use this, so the question was, how do we use this in Hennepin County? We actually use it in the Kaizen events. And so we do look at um, the current state and then the future state. So when we start looking at the current state, we say these are the, and, and we, these Kaizen events are four days long sometimes, so they're, they're pretty brutal, but we come out with some good results. So we talk about in very great detail, here are all the components of a process, or all the elements, and then we talk about only within what we have, how would you change this in that closed world thinking? And so sometimes we multiply it, sometimes we, um, sometimes we divide. I'll give you an example about multiplication. Okay, so the, the ABLE, the, the action-based leadership program that we just started recently, we, we have a lot of people very interested in that program. It just started up, basically you leave your job for 18 months, um, somebody else fills that position, and then after you've been with us 18 months, you go somewhere else, and we don't know where that is at the time. So it's kind of risky to come into the program, but so far nobody has graduated because they've all been pulled out for promotions, so, so far it's working. <laughs> but um, we have a lot of people applying each time, and so we were looking at employee engagement, and employee engagement is really a big buzzword right now, but I'm really supportive of us keeping employees engaged. And I didn't want anyone to become disengaged because they had gone through the application process for this program. So I try to interview everybody who applies. That's one piece of it. But where we get to the multiplication is when we start rejecting people. And so um, we want to <laughs> reject them more than one time, which sounds so brutal. <laughs> but when we're telling people you're not going to be in the group, and so I, I called them and tell them that. I said, I'm sorry, you're not in the top group. But if you're all right with this, I'd like to have Scott from our office call you and talk about other opportunities available to you, even if you're not in this program. And so then Scott calls them if they're okay with that. And so far, they've all been okay with that. And then he explains that. And then, so that's like the second rejection. He's reminding them that we're not <laughs> hiring them. And then he says, you know, here's some other opportunities. And now, if you don't mind, I'll have Mike call you because he may be able to connect you with some people who can help you learn more about the organization. So we went through this whole SIT process and we looked at every component in our um, process, our hiring process for that program. And when we got to that rejection piece, I thought it was crazy to add or to multiply that rejection three times. But we change it each time, and we change it so it would be valuable to the person. And so it's more effort for us, but I feel better that 
I don't think we have disengaged people. They're not going to leave mad. They're going to leave with some tools to still learn something and to still grow. Very good question. Did everyone hear it? Okay, so how do we show results and how do we make sure that this program is going to continue? So after we've gone through an effort, whatever it is, we do follow-up. So there's a 30, 60, and 90-day follow-up. But I also, um, I annoy people for many months after <laughs> because I want to hear what's different and what's, you know, we can't invest all this time and energy into a program if nothing is different. And so I do report my results, it's actually our, our group's results, to county administration. And I tell people, if you, if you don't have anything different, I'm going to have to tell our county administrator nothing has changed even though we put all this time and attention to your problem. So that seems to make people pretty motivated um, <laughs> for some reason. And then um, we also are looking at a financial model for this, which is very tricky because as soon as you start assigning a dollar amount to what you've saved, then people are worried that you're going to say, all right, you just saved $100,000. Let's cut your budget by $100,000. So they don't want to tell us. So um, recently we put together the results over the past three years, two and a half years of um, these Kaizen events. And even with people not being willing to tell us information, we get some information from them. And we have saved, and that saved is also a kind of a soft number sometimes, um, we've saved $1.3 million. And that is a number that's getting people's attention. So even if you shorten it, then you're not paying interest because you have people's money. I mean, you shorten a process. So we actually have real dollar savings, but we're also showing how it contributes to the five values, the core values of Hennepin County. So there's soft and hard cost savings. We've got the microphone working now, so okay. here we go. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot, Pam, for uh, diffusing this concept into the community. I think it's important. Um, I think people, uh, you know, a lot of times we don't really realize that most invention comes from systematic uh, methods. Uh, the multiplication, addition, division was interesting. Uh, you know, a concept that I, I'm not sure is in SIT, but it'd be interesting to add is the mathematical concept of recursion, which is a process applying to itself. So, for example, could a process like SIT apply systematic thinking to itself to get itself further out into the world. Um, and just a you know, quick related concept is, because I, I mean, I think it's not out there. You listed a bunch of, you know, places where it's being used, but it's not as, um, it's not as you know, uh, uh, diffused as it might be, and it could be, you know, really useful. I uh, gave a, pro uh, a uh, presentation at a, a group called Product Camp over the weekend on systematic innovation, it's sort of an underground um, conference, and I asked for a show of hands how many people had heard of systematic innovation in any of its flavors, SIT or trees or, or yeah. uh, morph morph uh, morphological analysis, any of those. And this is a group of R&D professionals, and one person of like 50 raised their hand. So how can we use systematic thinking to advance systematic thinking? And I I actually followed you, which I'm amazed at. So <laughs> that was a, that's really good thinking, though. Um, and that's kind of what we talk about. We're, you know, I'm never done with my job because we're continuously improving. And in some ways, that's kind of a nice cap out because it's, um, you know, I never have to get to perfection. But perfection, I, we talk a lot about um, GIMO, which is good enough, move on. And so you can continue to move things along. Um, but don't ever think that you're done with your job because we need to keep, con everything needs to be improved. Except you. <laughs> Any other questions? I do have buttons up here if anyone wants them. And if you, I do have a resource list if you really want it, but I would tell you it's really information out there. Another question? Oh, do we have one final question? We just have one. I can be a runner.
Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning, but is this just internally in Hennepin County or is no. this a contract service that's offered to businesses and so forth in the area? Um, you can contract with them. The city of Minneapolis actually introduced them to me or me to them, however you want to look at that. But um, I was really amazed at what they were doing. And you can contract with them. The part that I think is really important is if you're going to contract with them, try to time it with another company so that you're sharing some of those costs of bringing them in over from Israel. So um, they're hoteling <laughs> and transportation costs add up in a hurry. So we try to be very careful about how we do it and who we allow to take the training and um, want to make sure that it is something that's really used in the organization. But anyone can, can talk with them about it or me. If you want to, ever want to give me a call, I love to talk. So that's just fine. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. You're a great audience. Oh. So thanks, Pamela. That was fantastic. And uh, so what's going to happen now is we'll have a short, like 45 minute kind of break period for lunch. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, but some of you may not have been here, uh, for lunch options, if you are sticking around, uh, upstairs, uh, they have Subway and Papa John's and take and grab like sandwiches and salads. Yes, so Nick will lead people upstairs. Um, there's also a convenience store that has some grab and go stuff. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the place where you can get, I think still uh, U of M made ice cream. I know today's not much of an ice cream day, but if you don't get out here, it's fantastic stuff and it's really inexpensive. Um, and then right across, if you are looking for something different, down the street, um, just down the block, there's Mims Cafe. Uh, it's another place to kind of grab and uh, sit down if you want to get some food there. The other thing I will mention, uh, WeCo, uh, which does uh, great work in accessibility, they have a table right outside the door. Please stop and talk with them. They're the only people offering swag today. <laughs> so they've got... <laughs> So they've got some fun, they have some fun little stress balls, they have candy, and they are very happy to talk with you about any questions you might have about what they do and how they might be able to work with you. So uh, please stop by and give them uh, a little bit of your time. And we will get started again, I think at 1230, and we will have a panel on uh, creating innovative spaces. So. And one more quick announcement as you're on your way out. You are all innovators, so please feel free to grab an, an, we have an innovation button if you'd like an innovation button. Also, I want to mention Hennepin County is going to be holding Innovation Day next Tuesday. We'll be having all kinds of uh, tables from 11 to 2 uh, featuring what kinds of innovations are going on in your county government, uh, as well as, well, I forgot our county, county government. And uh, as well as some really cool presentations in our auditorium on innovation, civic technology, and all kinds of cool open data related kinds of things. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. See you again in 45.